Hello, Internet! I'm Ellie the Purple Doofus, and welcome to Buddy Reads, where I read a small selection of a book and review it for you. Today, we are covering chapters 82 through 89 of The Wise Man's Fear by Patrick Rothfuss. I hope you've read up to that point yourself, because I do not want to ruin anything for you. This section starts out with our crew sitting around a campfire and telling stories, much like they do almost at the end of every day. This day, Kvothe knows that he's going to be asked to tell a story, and he really doesn't want to, so he's trying to think of a story to tell them to just Persuade them from asking him to do it again. And he tells a story that I've heard many, many times before when I was young. And it's about a little boy that was born with a screw for a belly button. And he goes around and he asks everyone in his town, what is this screw for? What is this screw for? And no one knows the answer. And then he goes to see a wise man. He says, what is this screw for? And the wise man says, oh, I know. And he pulls out a screwdriver and he unscrews the screw. And then the little boy's butt falls off. And at the end of that story, Martin, Hepe, and Dadden are like, his butt falls off? What happens after that? Does he get a butt still? Does he have a butt? How does he poop? What is going on here? Kamoth is like, eh? That, that's the end of the story. And what surprises him the most is Tippe. Because Tippe just starts busting out laughing. He's like, ha ha ha, his butt fell off. That's hilarious. It was just a great bonding moment between Kamoth and Tippe. And to have everything Everyone else be very confused by it was even better in my mind. The next day, it's just Tempe and Kavoth at the campsite while everyone else is off doing the tracking and everything. Tempe is starting to do his uh, moves that I originally thought were kind of yoga-like, but now I'm suspecting it's more karate or judo or one of those fighting techniques kind of things. The, the moves that they do to calm themselves and train themselves to be better fighters. And Kvothe is copying him behind him and throughout this entire stretch he's noticed that Tempe has been ignoring him. But today Tempe decides to correct him and he turns around and he tries to help. Kvothe with what he's doing and he tries to tell him to stand up straighter, to step with, with force, to be better. Kvothe tries to take his learning, his advice at heart because of course Tempe is going to know way more about this than he will. Then they both get called away by Martin. They're both excited because they think Martin found something that would lead them to the bandits. But what Martin actually found was this plant called Anne's Blade. The most interesting thing about this plant, if anything ever touches it, it will die. If a human ever touches it, if a human ever sweats on it, if a human even breathes on it, it will die. And look at how big it is. Kvothe and Tibber are like, wow, that, that's pretty interesting. And then Martin says, this lets you know that you are at the edge of a map and you are at a part where no one has ever been. That's when Kvothe kind of realizes that the mayor sent him out to nowhere where he could die at any moment. The bastard. And then we have a small interlude at the end with Kvothe, Bass, and the Chronicler, where a poor family comes in, and they, because they know that a Chronicler is there, and they want the Chronicler to transcribe their will. There is a incredibly touching scene. Well, not so much touching, but just adorable scene where Kvothe and Bass are trying to look after the baby boy. <laughs> it's very three men and a baby, but just two men and a baby. It's it's great. We come back to where Kvothe and his crew are sitting around telling tales, and Hepe starts telling a tale about Jax and the moon. And she's telling the tale so well. It's about this boy who is very unlucky. He is so sad about being so unlucky. And this tinker walks by and the tinker says, Oh boy, why are you so sad? And the boy says, I am just always sad. Nothing will make me happy. And the tinker says, Well, I bet that I have something in my cart that will make you happy. But if I have something in my cart that will make you happy, you have to give me your home. And the boy says, Well, that's great. What do I get if you don't have anything? that will make me happy and he says if I don't have anything that will make you happy I will give you everything in my cart I will give you my walking stick I will give you my hat I will give you everything the boy says deal and the tinker goes through his entire cart and the boy is just sitting there no that doesn't make me happy 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 I'm just being the most devious thought in my head is I would lie about it making me happy <laughs> <laughs> I would just take everything that the Tinker was worth. The Tinker goes through his entire supply, and then he finally gets to a pair of reading glasses, seeing glasses, just regular glasses. And the boy's like, what are those? And he's like, these are spectacles. These are like separate sets of eyes that you can use to see better. I want to try those on. And he tries them on, and he looks around, and he's like, what is that? And he's pointing up at this night sky, and the guy says, oh, 
that's the moon. And the boy says, that makes me really happy. And the teacher says, oh, so I win. No, the glasses don't make me happy. The moon makes me happy. And I want the moon. And the teacher says, I can't give you the moon. And the boy says, well, I guess then you can't make me happy. So I win everything in your cart. The tinker's like, okay. And then he gives him a stick and he's like, you know, could you please let me keep my hat? And the boy says, that wasn't the rule. That wasn't part of the game. The game was I got everything. So you have to give me everything. And it's at this point that everyone around the fire is like, yeah, this is going to bite him in the ass. And I'm like, well, that was part of the game. That was part of the deal. But I'm not a part of this world. So I don't know what's going on exactly. They mentioned that to cross a tinker is very bad luck. But this isn't really crossing him. This is just agreeing to his rules. And the boy goes off with his his cart. And he's looking up at the moon. He's like, moon, moon, moon. I want you, moon. I want you, moon. You make me happy, moon. Please, moon. Please, moon. And then Deaden interrupts. And he likens the boy's fruitless venture for the moon to their fruitless venture for the bandits. And it causes an argument throughout the cr- throughout the crew. Everyone is just so angry that Hepe stops telling the story. Eventually, that's all they're doing is arguing. They eventually resolve the argument and Deaden's like, can I please hear the rest of that story? And Hepe says, later. I can't tell it to you disjointed like this. I have to retell it all. And he's like, okay, will you please retell it tomorrow? And she says, yes. Yes, I will. The next day, there is Tempe and Cloth, and they are walking back to town to get supplies. And while they're walking back to town, they hear a rustling in the woods. And they're like, oh, shit. An animal jumps out of the bushes. And they're like, oh, oh, thank God. (laughs) Because they thought it was the bandits. They thought the bandits were after. But they were relieved when it was just an animal. And then they continue on their way to get to a bar to rest and buy food and eat and, you know, do those sorts of things. And when they get there to buy the food and do all those sorts of things, they're sitting down and this guy comes up to them and he looks at Tempe and he says, what are you doing in my town? And Tempe is like, I am just here. And Kavos tries to talk for Tempe and the guy's like, no, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to this guy right here in the warrior's drove. What are you doing in my town? Tempe says, I am here on business. The guy asks, how much would you charge to stand guard at the, at the castle or something like that? And Tempe says, I would charge about five jots a day. And the guy's like, five jots? You barely even talk. How many guys can you actually take on at once? Can you take on 20 guys at once? And Tempe says, no. <laughs> Are you crazy? I could take on four, maybe five, but not 20. And the guy kind of laughs at that, but it just kind of builds... The guy challenges Tempe to a fight. And Tempe says, okay, get a re- get three or four other people and I'll fight you. And Kaboth is sitting there like, oh, sh- crap. <laughs> what do I do? What do I do? And he like stands up and Tempe turns to him and he says, watch my back. Kaboth says, of course, I don't want anything to hurt you. And Tempe just says, no, watch my back. Kaboth says, okay. Tempe gets into this fight with four other people. There's like one woman and four other guys. He just takes him down in this like... Using all of his karate moves, just pa 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 pa, and it's down. Very easily done for him. It, it looks like a major league ba- basketball player just doing a layup. It's insane to Kvothe. He's like, wow, how did he do that so fast? And Tempe turns around to ask Kvothe to watch his back, and he notices Kvothe standing there with his hand around his knife, and Tempe gets really angered at this. He's really mad about this, and he, he's really disappointed about this. Tempe said, we should go. And Kvothe is like, okay. And they start heading back home, and Tempe says, I think I should talk to you about Lithani. Kvothe is like, oh, he's He's finally going to talk to me about what I want. Oh my god. Oh my god. Yes, 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 yes. But he's like holding all of that back because he doesn't want to show his excitement in front of Tempe. Tempe explains Lathani. Then that I realize that it's not so much a type of people. It's a type of living. He, He explains it and he's like, there's a right way to do things. And then there is other ways of doing things. And doing things the Lathani way is the right way to do them. It's this whole back and forth between him and Kvothe, where Kvothe is like, is it, you know, following the law? And Tempe says, yes and no. Is it being polite? Yes and no. Almost every question that Kvothe asks him, 
yes and no. Eventually, it comes down to every situation is different. Doing things the Lothani way is making sure that you're doing it the right way. And when he turned around to see Kavoth holding his knife before the, the fight was over, that's not Lothani. Because to pull your knife before you need to, or to ready your knife before you need to, is the wrong way to, to go about things. And he asks Kvothe if he understands. Kvothe is like, yes and no. And Tempe says, that's good. You shouldn't understand everything about it. And it's good that you realize that and say that you don't. And it makes Kvothe happy to know that he is doing right by Tempe and Lathani logic. Then we get back to the camp. Kvothe is surprised to see the three other people are in high spirits. They're happy. They're laughing. They're actually converging as a team and they sit down to finish the tale with Jax and the moon. Jax has been walking along with the sun or with the glasses looking up at the moon the entire time trying to catch the moon and he gets to this guy in the cave and the guy in the cave is looking through all the stuff in the in the caravan or cart and he comes across this bag Jax couldn't open. He says oh the rope is telling me that you bit it and scarred it and stabbed it and tried to tear it open. And Jax is like, yes, that's all I've done to try and open this bag. The guy's like, no, you've been doing it all wrong. I'm a listener. And you've just been trying to brutally open this bag when all you needed to do was, and then he brings the knot up to his lips and he says, will you please open for me? And the knot just kind of unravels. And he's like, here, here you go. And like in this bag is what looks like junk to Jax. A half-bent piece of wood, a a flute. And then there was a third thing that I can't remember right now. Jax looks at it all and he's like, what's this piece of wood? And the guy's like, that's a uh, foldable house. And he's like, foldable house? What do you mean? And he's like, you unfold it to unfold a giant house. And Jax is like, oh. And he like bends one thing and the guy's like, whoa, don't unfold it here. I'm inside a cave. You're going to like break my home. Jax is like, okay. And he tries to bend it back. And he's like, it won't bend back. And the guy's like, that's because you don't know how to. This is what you get for jumping ahead. Jax takes all of this stuff, tries to go on his way to follow the moon some more. Even though the guy is like, you know, I can teach you how to listen. I can teach you how to listen to the moon and it'll be easier for you to get the moon. And Jax is like, that's going to take too long. I just want to grab it and capture it and kidnap. And so Jax goes on his quest. He gets to this point at the top of a hill or a mountain, and he starts unfolding the house. And the house starts unfolding and unfolding and unfolding and unfolding and unfolding. And it's this giant mansion. But it's so big, Jax doesn't know what he's doing, that some of the walls don't make sense. Some of the rooms don't have ceilings. Some of the staircases go sideways to nowhere. But eventually it's so big that Jax could get to the top of it and he could look up and talk to the moon. The moon comes down and they have a pleasant conversation. Jax is like, oh, you make me so happy. You have to live here forever. And the moon is like, I can't stay here forever. I have to go up into the sky. That's my home. And Jax says, but you can live here forever. Will you please just live here forever? You're the only thing that makes me happy. Please, please make me happy. And the moon says, I can't. I would if I truly could, but I can't. I have to be up in the sky. I have to be where I belong. And Jack says, I could I could make you a home here. It could be any time you want here, in my mansion, doing whatever I want. Please, please, it's the only way I'm going to be happy. I haven't been happy for so long. Please. The moon says, I wish I could. I will give you whatever I can to give, but I cannot stay here. Jack says, okay, I only want three things. And he says, I want a piece of your heart. And the moon says, of course. And she folds her hands up in front of her chest and gives him a piece of her heart. And he's like, I want a kiss from you. And she says, of course. And she kisses him gently on the cheek. And he says, and I want your name. And the moon says, of course. And he pulls out this black box. And the moon says her name. And he traps it in the black box. And he's like, ha ha, I have your name now. Now you have to do whatever I say. And I say that you must live with me forever so that I am happy forever and ever and ever. When he does that, he either traps something else inside with it or some of her name escaped because only part of her name was in the box. The moon has to come back and stay with him for a little bit, but is not trapped with him forever. And that was pretty much Heppy's tale of why we don't see the moon at all times, every night every day. And I'm just kind of thinking, I wish that that Jax cave would have got what was coming to him instead of getting part of what he wanted. (laughs) 
I wish he would have been. Just, I don't know. I don't think he earned the right to be so much of a jackass because of how unlucky he was. But it's at the end of the tale that it starts raining. That's when Kabo starts to talk about how the mood of the crew just plummeted. At the very tail end of the section, everyone's sitting around and Tempe comes up late. And everyone's like, where have you been? What have you been doing? And Tempe's like, I just killed two people that attacked me. And Kvothe's like, why didn't you tell me sooner? And he doesn't understand that, that Tempe was very distraught because he killed two people. After he calms down and both everyone calms down, Kavo says, okay, Martin and I are going to go with you. You're going to show us where you killed these two people and we are going to track their trail back to their camp. And Deaden's like, why can't we go? It's this whole butting heads again. And it's really irritating with me how much Deaden just hates being there and hates having to listen to Kavo and how he just doesn't understand that. Eventually, Deaden and Hepe stay back at the camp and the other three go off to find the bandits. And that is pretty much where I'm leaving you for today because I am an evil, evil jerk. <laughs> I really kind of liked Jax's story up until the point where Jax didn't get his comeuppance, which is odd for me because I don't usually enjoy fairy tales. Other than that, I'm, I'm really enjoying this section because it's a departure from the rest of the books. Even though some people like Sam from Sam's Nonsense have told me that this part was very boring for them. I believe it's this part. They said there was like a 300 page section where they're just like, oh, come on, get it over with. And I think this is the part. They mentioned Woods. So... <laughs> but I'm enjoying it, even though I can definitely tell this is very different from anything else that has happened in this story so far. If you like what I'm doing, go ahead and click the subscribe button. If you like this video specifically, go ahead and click the like button. And go ahead and leave a comment letting me know your favorite fairy tale. Or favorite tale of any kind. I've been Alex the Purple Lord Doofus. This has been Buddy Reads reminding you to watch the Gem Radius. And I will see you all in the next section of The Wise Man's Fear by Patrick Ruffus. Toodles! <laughs>